All right, we got a special edition here of uh, all things Red Turtle. We bring in the big dog himself, sponsor of all of our videos, our thousands of videos, and that, of course, is the big dog, Rick Jacklich. Hey, Rick, I saw you talking to Deshaun Harris-Smith afterwards. Is he going to be your next uh, uh, spokesman after Rakim? Boy, he's like a uh, rocket pre-launch, you know. His uh, potential is amazing. We're a great kid. We, uh, you know, we met all the freshmen in, in in Italy when we went over with the team. And he's uh, going to be such a special player. Bruce, in Italy, you know, you really saw how he blended in with that team. He never forced anything. I think he waited the whole first quarter to even take a shot. But he has just a really high basketball IQ. He does everything well, you saw last night the one shot that he blocked. Uh, he's a good shooter. He's got a great NBA ready body right now. He's just, uh, you know, you saw him last night. I think he had 10 points in the first. He had 12 points total. And he's just like a stat stuffer, you know, rebound steals. He just does it all, high IQ. And for, uh, you know, for Kevin Willard to start him as a freshman, first game tells you everything you need to know about what a good player he is. Rick, I have to tell you something. I you you already had told me how good he was when you saw him in Italy, but I'm gonna be honest with you, you don't really believe it till you see it with your own eyes. And number one, this guy has a motor that doesn't stop. All right. He is just and the thing that got me, and you meant you just mentioned it, is how unselfish he is. All right. In other words, he had that great drive to the bucket where he might have taken a layup. And he hit someone for a three, one of the few threes that the team made. And you look at his line, all right, four for six from the field, uh, four for six from free throws. Uh, let's see here, three rebounds, four rebounds, two assists, uh, one block, and uh, one block and two steals. He did so, a great job on the press, even without the steals, you know. Uh, and the three freshmen, you know, I'm mean, called Kaiser and uh, Jonathan Lamose too. They're so quick, and the three of them on the court on a press that's trouble. And last night they had Maddie out front on the zone. Uh, that's a lot of lead. <laughs> you, have to remember, you have to remember something else about this squad. Those kids. It's their first game. You know, there's there's nerves, there's over anxiousness, there's everything, and uh, you just you have to understand that after a few minutes, the way that he played, and then it kind of took Jameer a while to get into it. You know, it's a whole new dynamic here. And I think that I think that he ran into problems a little bit with uh, who was on the court at the same time. I noticed he was a little frustrated at the end. But I'll tell you one thing. You're talking about Jameer? Yeah, not Jameer. I'm talking about Willard. Willard yeah. at the end of the game – uh, he just had a frustrated look, and I heard him speaking with Johnny afterwards. Uh, he just like, you know, and then once again, you know, let's start off right down the line. Julian Reese, what do you say? Eight for 11, only 23 minutes. But, Rick, this guy's got to learn how not to commit a foul. All right. Well, I think he did that last night, Bruce. I think he only had one in the first half. I think he only had two for the game, if I remember right. Rick? Um, Rick, he had four. Hey, four. He had four. I take that back. And he had four. He had you right with nine minutes left, and Willard left him in the lineup. He almost you're right. Like, you he know. had one in the first half. He did have four, and you're right. You're right. So, um, and they were the all, one foul was silly. I mean, I, I, that was a just a terrible call. That wasn't a real foul. I mean, that was just silliness on the refs part. We're not, we're not going to win with him on the bench. You saw it last year when we played Alabama. Everything was fine until what? Until he got in foul trouble. Then the then game was the, over. The game was over for all intents and purposes. Uh, but he played great. 18 points, uh, eight rebounds. Uh, let me see. He got a couple turnovers, but two blocks. He dominated the game. Then, of course, Jameer Young, always when it mattered, he was there. He gives you that senior leadership. I, I think, though, it's, well, do you think there'll be some adjustment that he's not going to be a guy who gets in the 20s anymore that much, is he? Well, they don't need him to get in the 20s, but it's interesting. It looked last night, 
uh, you know, the freshmen were smoother than either Dante or, or Jameer. And I don't know what that was. I guess Jameer's shot just wasn't falling from three. And that's a little bit of it. But, you know, as the senior point guard that he is, he's trying to get everybody their shot as well. He's a very unselfish player. So he'll be there when they need him. I mean, he's a special, special player. And having other shooters like Kaiser and uh, Harris Smith on there, on the court at the same time, that's going to make Jameer better as well. Yeah, no doubt. Dante Scott, 35 minutes, play more than anybody, uh, except Jameer. Jameer also played, well, he played 33. Uh, Dante Scott, you, you thought he was a little bit off his game. He had nine points, only right. two rebounds. But he, he tends to have that sometimes. And uh, again, again, he he kind of, when he gets inside, he's pretty tough. I got to tell you one thing. Julian Reese is almost unstoppable inside. All he's right? got some nice moves now. Yeah, he's great moves. Everything just lays into the net easily. Jamie Kaiser played 15 minutes, had that one spell when he hit two jumpers in, a, what, a minute? Smooth. Hit that first three and the second shot from the top of the key, yep. You know, I was sitting there with Wayne watching the game yesterday, and the first thing Wayne said to me, he said, look how much bigger this team looks than any team I think we've ever had. This team is big physically, and even Deshaun Harris-Smith, what is he, 6'6"? 6'5", 6'6", yeah, and a real 6'5", 6'6". And then Kyler, same size, and then, yeah, they have a lot of size. They put Maddie out there with Julie on the Juju on the floor at the same time. You're talking about big, that's... <laughs> That's a real side. I got to tell you, Dante though, to three, and that's huge. When when uh, Deshaun Harris Smith went down with a cramp, I almost had a breakdown. I said, "This can't happen." All right, yeah, because you never know what can happen. Which one? When he first went down, that it's all wrapped up. Do you know what it is, Rick? Or the cramp? No, the left leg was all wrapped up. All I know is that he went back with Matt, the trainer, and they hit him with one of the massage guns. When he first went down was after that play, and I, I thought he turned an ankle at first. And then when he's laying there, I, I'm sitting there going, cramp, 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 please be a cramp. And then it looked like it was just the way that Matt was stretching the leg. It looked like it was a cramp. Oh, he never would have been put back in that game if he didn't have a cramp. Correct. Correct. Twelve months ago, we were talking on the court after one of the games, and you said, Bruce's kid, Noah Bachelor, can really hit the shot. I got to tell you something. I understand he takes 500 shots. A, a day. Well, he was over two last night. I'm waiting for him to explode. I think that Willard really likes him, likes the way he plays. Got to hit his shots, Dundee Rick. So, Bruce, yes, he does. He's a kid, local kid out of Frederick. Uh, comes in last year. Every time I saw him in practice, he was lights out shooting the three. You get him in a game, and if he makes that first three, beautiful. He didn't make that first three very often. He really struggled with a shot in the games. Like, how can a kid in a scrimmage where he's got quality players guarding him shoot lights out and in the game really struggle? I don't know what it is. And I'm hoping he just gets going and gets that confidence because that will help them so much. Well, I think he's going to get the minutes this year and he's going to get the opportunity. If and, he hits uh, his shot, Bruce, you know, he's got a lot of competition waiting to grab that spot. He was the first guy off the bench last night. And yep. if he's not hitting his shot, the first guy off the bench is going to be Jamie Kaiser. Swanton Roger, uh, the kid from Canada, four rebounds. I thought that was a nice game for him. Uh, Bruce, he was the most improved player that I saw in in Italy. Really, really came along. You didn't see it last night. And I think he's coming off an injury. He's just been practicing just a couple times before the game last night. But if we see from him what I saw from him in Rome, that's going to be – really big for us remember oh, when we won the championship you had four bigs right you had Lonnie Baxter you had Chris Wilcox you had Ryan Randall and you had Taj Holm last year we had Juju and that's it you know 2000 the first half and the game's over now with Maddie with Calum you know he's getting some bigs in there hopefully we'll get Mr. Queen coming on board we'll hear in the next couple of days I'm hoping you know that's gonna be a big improvement but they, you need the bigs Rick, who puts on a Maryland uniform and poses with his parents and doesn't commit? I, I, don't, I don't get that. I swear. I just don't get it why he didn't commit. But uh, let's hope it works out. 
Uh, I can tell you this: he's got Juju and uh, Jonathan. You know, the same Francis boys working them hard. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I'm sure they were. And I did notice uh, when Lamoth came in yesterday, another guy with a big motor. I mean, you know, I, he really didn't get much of a chance. He only played three minutes, but his time will come. And uh, you know, it's tough as a freshman to break in, but this kid, Deshaun Harris Smith, and I, I don't know any of the numbers on NIL, but I heard he got the big numbers, and now I see why. I will tell you this much. In my eyes, and I've watched a lot of basketball in my day and played a lot of basketball, uh, we'll be lucky to keep him for two years. He's that. I think he's that good. He is that good, potentially. Yeah, he but at is. the same time, right? I mean, we've seen how many times we've we seen this, Bruce. You know, we saw this. You see this in football. You see this in basketball. I'll go back to Robert Carter. Robert Carter was a really good player in Georgia Tech. Comes to Maryland, really good player. Okay, he goes to the NBA camp, and they tell him, you know, you're probably a second round pick. Okay, he leaves Maryland, goes into the draft, mm -mm, doesn't get drafted. <laughs> You know, it's only the first round that you have the guaranteed money. Right. I don't understand why if you're not going to be a first round pick. And these general managers are telling these kids where they're slotted. If you're not going to be a first round pick, why don't you come back to school and play yourself into the first round? I listen, Rick. You're preaching to the choir. But then again, sometimes guys come back and and uh, and their mind, it, it harkens me back. Uh, who's the kid who? Uh, John Gilchrist. Yeah, should he have come back? I mean, you don't know. I think when the NBA comes calling and you're going to be in the first round, you have to go. You know, if you're going to be in the first round, you have to go. I get that, no doubt, no doubt. Let's we're putting the cart way before the horse, so let's not worry about that now. And you know, give the mount some credit. And you know, it's funny when I got home last night, I said, you know, this team looked awful good uh, last night, and they hung in there, even though at one point they were down by. 25 or 26. And I noticed they beat Bucknell in the scrimmage. You don't beat Bucknell if you're not a good team. You know, a high mid-major like that. So uh, give them credit. Give the coach credit. One thing I've noticed that maybe you can, I know you're, you know, I, I'm certainly friendly with Coach Ward, but you've been with him a lot. Seems like every coach in basketball loves him. You know what I mean? When I see the greeting after the game, win or lose, you know, it's like a warm, you know, thanks for inviting us. You know, I know Matt the Mount got some money last night for coming, I would assume. And, uh, you know, they don't even mind taking a shellacking from them. Okay. Uh, well, what is shellacking? I mean, it's a good thing Maryland was playing the defense they were playing. I mean, we kept that team, I think, the 34, 35% shooting from the field. Right. They shut down a big score. So I think Kevin is probably really happy with the defensive effort. The turnovers kept that game close. Well, Too now we got three games coming up. Okay, right? Are you, are you going to Carolina? Or are you going to sit that I one? Can, out? I can. I'd love to go down there. We got Davidson Friday night, and they get the winner of uh, UAB and Clemson. Exactly on and Sunday. If they played like they did last night, although in fairness to Coach Willard, he gave everybody a chance last night. He really did, and I and I commend him for that. Uh, yeah, the walk ons don't get the chance, but that's life. These are the scholarship kids. But, uh, if you know they go down and play like they did last night against Davidson, all right, with 15 turnovers, they're gonna have their first loss. And I don't think that would be the end of the world, okay? I really don't. I, I can't see them going through Davidson and Clemson or UAB. Uh, Clemson's rated exactly where they are, Maryland's 32nd. According to Jay Billis, and even though he's a dookie, we have to respect him. He's a pretty smart guy, and he's got uh, Clemson 35th. So if Maryland could get through the next three games and then at Villanova and be two and one, they'll be in great shape if they can do that. All right. And that's not, that's no guarantee. Uh, to go to well, Villanova, to go to Villanova yeah. on the road is a tall task. Absolutely. So let's talk about that Davidson game first. I mean, they've they've got to defend the three because you're going to see a load of threes jacked up from the Davidson team. Remember, uh, Steph Curry's not there anymore. <laughs> I know they still still got, still got shooters. So you remember that game when we played them in the uh, where was it in Buffalo? And I don't know. It was the first round of the NCAA's, 
and I'll never forget uh, Steph had an unbelievable game. We won, all right? We won, uh, not by much, all right? But the, the Terps won. And afterwards, I talked to DJ Strawberry. And I said, what would you think of Curry? And he said, Bruce, he said, you know, I'm from L.A., all right? And I play with pros out there on the playgrounds. I play with everybody, all right? I might not be in that category, but I play with these guys all the time. He said, I've never, ever had a guard anybody like him. He he nailed it right on the nose. And from that point on, he dominated college basketball for the next year. And yeah, he did. The rest is history, as they say. You know, you so, want to talk about Davidson history. Just think, you know, Lefter Drizel had a Davidson team back with 68. That was on the verge of the Final Four. And who beats them? Right. Charlie Scott beats him at Carolina and right. Charlie Scott had told left him coming to Davidson. And then Carolina steps in and yanks him away to be the first black man ever to attend the University of North Carolina on a basketball scholarship. And here's lefty with his player, you know, that steals the final four from him. And Davidson has never been the same since then. They've been nowhere near as good, even with with Curry's. No, they didn't. You know, they played okay with Curry, but they were never. They made the tournament. That speaks enough uh, when a school like that can make the tournament. But uh, all right, let's move on. We've been talking all good, and now Rick, I hate to pin this on you, okay, but uh, I'll ask you what happened five and zero oh to five and four, and let's be real. I thought they played great against Ohio State. Nothing to be ashamed of. Down by three points going to the fourth quarter against the number one team in the country. That's not, it's a, that's almost a win for where Maryland's at. But holy What's cow. More, so more happened? frustrating. Let, let's talk about that Ohio State game. Because, Bruce, that game should have been 20 to three at the half in favor of Maryland. Maryland dominated the first half. Um, Lead it through such a stupid, stupid interception, and the end of that half, not throwing the ball either into the end zone or into the turf, right to stop that clock to get three points. There's gigantic, and just the feeling going into the locker room at that halftime, and being where they were instead of where they could have been, it was such a deflating thing. And I think, I think they were hung over from that in that second half. And that carried it. There's no excuse not to beat Northwestern. I mean, they have no offense. Well, you're skipping no Illinois. Offense. You're skipping Illinois at home. I'm, I'm saying Northwestern hurt me personally more than Illinois. But yeah, and some of this is some of this is predictable because we talked at the beginning of the year, Bruce. And people ask me, oh, you know, you got a hey, you got a quarterback, you got a shot. Well, the team will go as the quarterback goes if he's upright. <laughs> especially a guy like Leah, okay? You pressure him, he's a different quarterback than he can sit in the pocket. Everybody is, but he in particular. So it all comes down, you have five new offensive linemen. That, that makes a difference. And they haven't been able to protect him these last couple of games. The second half of Ohio State, they couldn't protect him. When they have six sacks uh, was- in one game, six sacks in another game. Uh, and then, you know, he gets happy feet in the pocket when he gets some pressure on him. Uh, Penn State shut down their running game completely. Uh, but you're 17 for 17 in throws at the beginning of that game. I think you had to call more more pass plays in that game. Well, I'll tell you, but, I'll tell you a funny story. You know, my brother, one of my brothers lives in uh, in Florida. Big Dolphins fan, loves Tua. So he doesn't really watch Maryland. I guess if Maryland was number in the top 10, he would watch it. But he, I'm talking to him Saturday morning. I said, you got nothing to do today. Watch Maryland play Penn State because uh, two of his brothers play. You know, two is God down there. All right. So he's watching the game. He calls me up. He said, yeah, this kid is fantastic. He said he evades the rush. He's almost a little bit quicker than Tua. All right. And he's half the size. Listen, well, that, that's true. But 17 straight completions. I mean, what else can you do? And we're losing the game, all right? So and they someone, would have been down twenty-one nothing with him at seventeen for seventeen if it hadn't been for the rubbing the kicker penalty. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was just a beat down. And I'll be honest with you, I know everybody loves to beat Penn State, but we play him next year, all right? Last game of the year at Penn State, and then we don't see him for four or five years. And I tell you what, I'm happy about it. I I had enough of Penn State. 
for some reason, they got our number. And I don't know what it is or why, but we play Michigan and we play Ohio State much tougher. All right? It doesn't mean we haven't beaten them, but Lord almighty, I mean, we gave we gave Ohio State probably a, their toughest game of the year almost, except Notre Dame. And I think Ohio State's a paper tiger. And I can't stand that Ryan Day. You know, in the interview afterwards, I watched the press conference. I always, that's part of my job. I watched the Maryland game. Press conference. Yeah, I guess he never praised Maryland one time. They said, were you shocked to be entering the fourth quarter in a struggle with Maryland? He said, look, it's strictly because we played bad. What kind of answer is that? The team's in the conference. The team's fighting to get ranked. And by Maryland getting ranked, it only helps Ohio State. Okay. I was so, I tell you what, I was so mad that I can't tell you. I I, I didn't want to ask Loxley about it because that's putting them on the spot at the press conference on Tuesday. And then I kicked myself for not doing it because I was so mad at him that I can't explain to you. And another guy you got to be made at right now, I'm going to ask your opinion on this. Look, you and me, we're, we we thank ourselves every day for having John Harbaugh coaching this team. Yeah, we are. Great. I know analytics. Well, he learned his analytic lesson. You know, he uses his field goal kicker now. All right. But what a prince of a guy. But the brother, you know, I don't get it. What's going to happen with that, Rick? You think I tell you what? I hear the other coaches. You saw the Rutgers coach barely shook his hand. All right, right. he didn't want no parts of him. I know we're waiting for that decision. This is on Wednesday, and we're waiting for that decision. It might come today or tomorrow. What do you think it should be, Bruce? I mean, this is I the, think, this is the Houston Astros of college football now. Yeah, but right? you know what? You know what? I I hear a lot of guys. You know, I'm. Except for doing this stuff, which for me is not work. You know, I don't work. I watch the sports news in the morning. And you hear a lot of mixed opinions that everybody steals signals. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's different. It's different. If you're on second base, right, in a baseball game, and you steal a signal, great for you. Right? right. Awesome. That's the game. What's not the game is when you videotape, okay, and then play back and see what play is going and what pitch and what's pitch, and then you figure out the code. Okay, it's the same thing in football. If you can sit on the other sideline and and break their signals, great. That's that's part of the game. When you videotape it and then you go back and match up the signal with the play, that's cheating. If I had to take a guess, Rick, he gets at least two games, maybe three. Well, he's already spent three. He's already been at three. He's going to get three more or two more. I don't think that if Michigan is in the final four, they're going to suspend them. That would be a, uh, <clears throat> that would be a pretty harsh blow. To so take I don't know. Down. I don't know where I am on this. You know, there, there's two arguments. One is, gee, do you really, should you penalize the players that are there? Right. That's, what, the that's one of the that points that are being made. Okay. Do you penalize them? I say, well, you're not penalized that you penalize the school. Okay. The school should be responsible, just like schools should be responsible and are responsible in NCAA rules when the coach is at a school, the coach cheats at the school. That coach can fly off, as so many have done, to a different school without any sanctions, then they're stuck on the well, If he gets school. suspended again, he'll be in the pros next year. He's gone. He's not going to stay there. But Dominique Foxworth had a great point, a great uh, corner from Maryland. He said, if I'm guarding Tyreek Hill, and I know beforehand that this play, he's going to run a fly pattern. I back myself up 20 yards away, and I'll wait for him to catch up. I'll be back 40 yards. <laughs> right. But but it's true. If you know what play is coming, if you can steal the signals to that level, but <clears throat> steal a signal seems to me to be part of the game. But uh, he he obviously – I have a question for you. What in the hell is the FBI looking into? That seems I, bizarre. There must the be FBI, more to it than we've heard. I, I don't know. I take it for the FBI was called. What the FBI? What, this is a football game. Don't they have right. other problems? You know what I mean in this country? You know. You would think, yeah, you would think. FBI so. had been so hot the last 
four or five years. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know what problem. you're doing. I don't know what you're doing looking at football steel and signals. I mean, that's uh, it makes no sense. Uh, all right, Rick, here's the thing, and I'm worried about it. Do the Terps get the sixth win? I mean, what does I know your heart says yes. What does your mind say? I mean, nobody's closer to this team than you are. I mean, you travel with them, you do everything. You you know Saturday's you, a big Saturday's a big game. Are you big, you big know, game? Uh, and close friends with Loxley. Like, mean, what do you think? I don't like having to go to that. We're not beating Michigan. Let's get it straight. With or without Harbaugh, I don't see a way or a path to beat Michigan. So you got to beat Nebraska or you got to beat Rutgers. Right, and they're both on the road, and that's problematic. You know, you know when Tua went back to pass against Northwestern, we're winning seven to nothing, and we're driving, and the ball comes out of his hands. He didn't fumble. He did intercept. It came out of his – it just – all of a sudden, it, I never saw anything like it, okay? And then and then instead of just hitting the ground, it, it pops into the hands of the lineman. Like, you talk about bad luck on that one. It's like, I know, what was that? This is Northwestern. I don't care how good they played that day. There's just no way talent-wise they're on our level. And truthfully, they looked like they had better talent that day but as the game wore on. They played quarterback, harder. Quarterback had a birthday that day. But that's all in the past now. We're five and four. But we sure don't want to lose the next three games and end this season five and seven. I mean, that would be – that would be big. You get to six, go to a bowl. Maybe it's a quick lane bowl or anything. And- but- as you know, Bruce, it's the hangover from something like that on the recruiting trail, right? Just imagine they lost into a, a few guys already. Somebody committed, decommitted today from Texas, you know, which I'm sure hurts Loxley. But look, just Loxley. imagine it, if you're in a kid's living room this week, right? It was between you and Penn State. Just remember what the kid's hearing from Penn State and what he, you know, what he's hearing from his buddies. If he's trying to decide between these two schools, that is the hangover. On this, you know, on these games, it's so important on the recruiting trail. You know what's funny about uh, what's that? Who was talking about? Andy Katz was talking about it after Michigan State uh, lost to uh, everybody. No, well, they lost to James Madison in basketball. And Andy Katz says, you know, in football, if you up open up your season, you're a top twenty team, and you lose a game like that, your season's done. You know what I mean? You're cooked. In basketball, it doesn't mean a thing. All right? Like, Maryland loses to Davidson. The world's not coming to an end because it's all about the conference schedule, the 20 games in the conference. But uh, – And getting better through the season. Right? That, yeah. That's always the key, too. With, with freshmen. And I tell you what, I watch Izzo, and you would have thought that the world had ended uh, in this post-game press conference after they lost. He said, I'm shaking up this team, and – Nobody's got a guaranteed starting position. My guy who scored 35 points, he doesn't have anything guaranteed. He said, I got to see who really wants to play. And it's the first game of the year. That's a little drastic, you know, against the, and you know why he took that game, Rick? I don't know if you read about it. His uh, sister's son, his nephew is on the coaching staff at James Madison. And he said, you know, uh, Uncle Tom, can you, yeah, can you do us a favor and get us on the schedule? And he did. And look he's like, out of the will, though. Huh? He's going to wrote him out of the will the next day. You know. <laughs> but uh, whatever, you know. Now, there's the class coach for you. I, I, love I, him. I admire him, I love him so much. He, and, the and one he, thing I, I can't stand about him is the way he works the refs, because it's effective. You know, when Danny Manning was here, Maryland played them in one of the COVID games. And I went to the basket. I went to the co- to most of the COVID games, and I sat in the upper deck by myself in a section. And I'm watching this game, and Danny Manning is getting outworked by the refs by him because we should have won that game, and we lost in the last minute or so. And uh, I'll never forget one game, Rick. I got a call from the SID for lacrosse. And Maryland was playing, I think it was Johns Hopkins. And he said, Bruce, there's a rumor that this gate's going to be open. All right. Well, you know, and they were letting me come to see the game is what they were doing. So uh, I go to the game. I was the only person in the stadium. All right. And it was. It could have been some parents there. I shouldn't say that. I don't remember now. 
But Rick, you could hear every word that they were screaming at each other. And it was not all, there were a lot of four letter words in there. <laughs> but it's amazing what you can hear in an empty game. All right. Uh, but that's that. All right. We got two more, two or three minutes. And this has been great. Again, Rick, of course, sponsors our show, Big Dog Law Firm. Uh, and congratulations on your son. I know that makes you prouder than things that you do, being named, uh, one of the top lawyers at his age in the country. That is, you look at that smile on your face. You can't wipe it off. But uh, top, uh, top 40 trial lawyers in the country under the age of 40. He's 27 when he won that award. I mean, just amazed. National Trial Lawyers Association. Well, I'm, proud. he got I've his heard mom's brains, Bruce. I've heard about <laughs> stuff. Hey, next time I get involved in something, I'm calling your son. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. But anyway, got to talk a couple minutes. I know you're a big Ravens fan. How good is this team, Rick? I mean, they should you. be nine and zero. Oh. I, you know, I it's, I still can't believe they lost to the Colts the on that fair catch. It just blew my mind. And then Pittsburgh game, they should be nine and zero. Oh. Four but touchdowns it, were dropped. Four touchdowns against Pittsburgh. They uh, the one nine and zero. Bateman in the end zone was the real killer, and the Aguilar down the down the seam was a killer. But you're right. But uh, boy, they they have it all. And how about this kid Mitchell? What a story, Bruce. His dad. Maybe the most famous play in Ravens history, top three for sure. Right. You know, the block field goal against uh, Tennessee. against Tennessee, and then he returns for that touchdown. And then later on, Ray Lewis rips that ball away from Andy George on that interception. You know, I mean, what a game that was, too. And here, his son, and of course, Anthony was undrafted, makes the, I still say, the biggest play in Ravens history. And now his son, undrafted, after everything he did in East Carolina, you saw it all through camp. Everybody's talking about how good this kid is. You saw it against the commanders in the preseason, how good he was. He gets injured. He's got the hamstring, got the shoulder injury. Comes back. Nine carries for, what, 135 yards. <laughs> and uh, it, was un it was unbelievable. The 60-yard run was incredible. The 40-yard run was a burst of speed like you can't imagine. And then one guy I feel sorry for, though, is J.K. Dobbins. Was, oh, I know. He's got to sit there and watch this, and his heart's got to be broken to see how well this team's playing, and he's not part of it. And he's got to go through that rehab again. And, uh, I mean, you know, and how can he fight for a long-term contract, you know? But, you know, the Orioles did something that was, I thought, fantastic. They, know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but – They've already said that unquestionably Batista's out all next year. Right. It's not even a question. He'll be back for spring training in 25. And yet they extended his contract. All right. So in these two years where he's not playing or the year he's not playing, he gets paid. And look, you never know how you recover from Tommy John. But right. I think. Uh, but, but Elias has done this before. He's done this two other times. One with John Means, right? He signs means for a lot less than he could have uh, long term because he's smart and went to him when he had the Tommy John surgery and locked him up. So it's just Michael Elias being super smart again. Can he? Let me ask you a question. Do you think they're going to be able to lock up Adley and Gunner? I hear they really want to. They but have Scott to. Bor but Scott Boris, oh my God, Rick, he's impossible. He will Bruce, not. When he will not give a deal. You know, salaries are going like this. Get them here. Don't wait to get them here. Okay. Peter Angelus never learned that. But well, they signed Corbin Carroll. I think he got like what 19 a year, million a year for eight years. That's what they got to do with Gunner and Adley. They just say he's well, worth it. They're both worth it. They're generational players. You can't have a more important position in baseball as a single guy to me than a catcher. Right. And now you have a kid like Henderson, who's what, 23 years old. You can see he's going to be a super, super, superstar. He had 28 homers this year. I mean, what else does he have to do? After batting 190 for how long? For the first month and a half. I mean, right. right 28 of those home runs were like, you know, end of May on. Uh, and he can play second. He can play short. He can play third. Uh, he's a gold glover everywhere, potentially. Uh, you have to sign that. He's going to be an MVP of the league multiple times. 
You have to sign him, Bruce. And you know and, who and, else? And, you know who else is signed up with uh, Scott Boros? All right, the truth, Mister Jackson Holiday. He is the truth, Rick. I mean, he is. You know, he'll be in that start. I know where he's going to play. Okay, so but, that is funny. I was talking. To, we went, went and had crabs a couple of weeks ago with with Cal Rick and his beautiful wife, and Governor Ehrlich and his wonderful wife, and that's what we were talking about when Holiday's there. Where does Holiday play? Where does Gunner play? I'm assuming it's going to be Westberg at second, Holiday at short, and Gunner at third is my assumption. But I was talking to Cal about how, and this was early in the season. How, what did Cal Gunner, say? I'm curious. So I said to Cal, you know, hey, I think a lot of reasons why Gunner had struggled early on was because he's not locked in at one position, right? You, you're second, then you're third, then you're short. And he agreed with that, and he thought, you know, he's going to be a superstar shortstop. And he thought once he got locked in, he'd settle in and really start hitting. But that's before you really realize how he's going to be on that team next year. I mean, he flew completely through the minor oh, leagues. He'll be, they might send him to Norfolk for a month to get ready for big league pitching. And like everybody else will struggle a little bit when he comes up. But I think, I think you got it wrong. I think that uh, Gunner will put be Gunner short. short. Yeah. And I think Westberg will be a third. All right, and I think that Holiday will be a second. But remember, Holiday can also play center field. But here's the tough part: who are you going to get? I mean, you can't sign everybody. I mean, you can't give big money to Montcastle and Santander. Uh, I talked to Stan the fan about it, San Charles, and you know him well. Uh, and he thinks that a big trade's coming. The Orioles are probably not going to sign anybody. They want a left-handed starter. That's obvious. And Wardro Rodriguez fits the bill, but are they going to give him $18 million for six years a year? I don't think so. So I think they're going to trade, and they it, it's going to break your heart or my heart to give up Santander or to give up my castle because my castle carried this team for a while. And then don't forget – It's Santander through August and September. You know, you got Colby Mayo down in the Meyer, minors, and you got uh, uh, Heston Kierstead. They won't hit. You know, the manager is more uh, impressed with Hirstad than almost anybody. And uh, Colton Kowser really didn't get a fair shot up here. So Mullins, who batted about 220 after he stole a game with the steel in right field, the greatest catch I think I've ever seen, and then hits a home run to win it. How about that? How about that? Just a little stretch of that inning, right? <laughs> Stealing that home run and then hitting that home run. And Rick, oh my God. Oh, I, or for, I was, you know, I came home from the second game and my wife said to me, she says, you know, you don't look that upset when we were owing to, I said, how can I be upset after all the joy that they gave us this year? And I honestly believe that they kind of like, uh, with the, what they had to go through to win that pennant, all right, to beat Tampa, I think it ruined the Orioles and Tampa. I mean, what the Orioles had to do, I mean, uh, Look but, at Tampa's start. But but Houston Houston threw his arm again. out. You know, I mean, like, eh, I mean, it was like just too much. Every game they had to win. Every game was pressure. And bless Brandon Hyde, what a job he did. People said, oh, he messed up. He put in Webb in the two playoff games and caught. You know what? If it wasn't clear Texas at that time of the year was the best team, you're, you're not thinking straight, all right? There's they no went 11 on the road. And yeah, playoff. let me tell you something. Adelos Garcia, when he threw the guy out when he, the first game in the in Arizona from mid right field, and he throws a strike home, I said, "This guy's in another world." All right. And and, first, they had their top three starters were on the shelf through the yeah. beginning of the playoffs. Yeah, they, I, well, they were lucky. You know, we got Flaherty and they got Montgomery, and that's just a matter of luck. <laughs> I mean, that's so, just a matter of luck. So you're talking about a trade, so they have to trade because they, yeah, they have a great minor league, but they have some of these guys are just going to be blocked. I mean, you can only play how many shortstops, right? So you, you're going to have, to me, your future in the infield is it's Westberg, right? It's Gunner and it's Holiday. Okay, the Joey Ortiz is a great player. You have these other guys in the minor leagues; they're going to be great players, but that's going to be your trade capital, and that's why I don't have a problem. Elias taking a shot and getting to Flaherty. You gave up three prospects, but all those prospects were blocked. You didn't know Flaherty was just going to be as eh as he was. 
But that's what they got to do. They got to package some prospects and go get a number one and a lefty. Or whatever. But I, I trust Elias. And you got to remember one thing, my final comment today. That's the guy you got to resign. All right. Is Mike Elias. All right. Because this, this guy is the real deal. Hey, Rick, this was great. We're going to do this periodically now. It's always fun, Bruce. I love you. Review Jack, everything. Bruce. We'll get it up on YouTube and on the site and everything. And as always, we thank you for your support and more so for your friendship. Me and you have been friends a long time now. And uh Bruce, remember how we met? We met, I know how it was at the bowl in San Francisco at Tadish's. It was so <laughs> ironic. You I was with my son-in-law, all right, who is uh a lawyer for Venable now. And uh we were eating, I told you what to order to get the uh, the clam chowder. <laughs> I, I remember like it was yesterday. I still right? remember that bar in San Francisco. What was it? The Emerald Bowl or something? The Emerald yeah, Exactly Bowl? right. Exactly right. right. We're in San Francisco and then went up to Tahoe after that bowl and went skiing with the kids. It was just a great, great time. Great time. That, that's how we met. That's funny. And you said, you know, I know you, I knew you from somewhere. You said to me. <laughs> But it was funny. But the look, look at accident. But we'd have become friends anyway. There was no way that we could not. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know what I love? Real quick before we go, uh, I love how Gary Williams comes to every game. Isn't that beautiful? I, isn't it good? I mean, don't you get a good feeling when you look and you see the legend sitting there? You Absolutely. know, I'm sure you've talked to him how much he loves Willard, and uh, you know, so like. It's yeah. so like in so many ways. It's so great to see him there. Rick, thanks so much. We'll sign off and we'll do this again when when we feel it's time. Probably with you know, let's try and make it a monthly thing or a tri weekly thing. Okay, buddy. Be beautiful. Absolutely. Thanks, All Bert. right. You're That's it for today. Remember all our shows and terptalk.com. Good uh, terps. All right.